Good morning to you all. Today is Holy Saturday. Uh, I'm not preaching about tradition because different people do different traditions on a certain day like this. But today I'm going to share with you uh, what God has given me to share with the whole church. So as we know that at the present time, Jesus is in the grave, buried, lying there. So what is the church supposed to be doing? Let us pray. Teach me your ways, Lord, that I might delight in you and in all your wondrous deeds. Speak to me that I might hear the marvelous of your creation and of the redemption you have proposed for all who turn to you. Illumine my way that I may be led into your loving presence. Take me through the Garden of Eden and out into the well. Show me the rising of the waters and the Ark of Promise. Lead me with the Son to be sacrificed and bring me home with the faith of Patria. Send me out on the journey from exile towards the promised land. Let me watch sibling rivalry turn into the establishment of a nation. Help me to recount the warnings of your prophets that I might turn to you, be obedient to your law, and mindful of those who are in need of my help. Make me a part of that age old community of faith. Enable me to reveal the story of your son, singing praises with shepherds and angels at his bed, staring in astonishment at his baptism as the heavens open, gazing with amazement at the authority of his preaching, learning of you through his teaching and wondrous deeds. Then take me on the way of the cross with its betrayals and denials. Take me into the courtyards of priests and king, awaiting the verdict of his trials. Let me stand with those who have loved him best. And let me hear him speak of abandonment, thirst, love, forgiveness, and saying it is finished. Father, I just want to thank you. Be with us this morning. Father, we don't forget those who are suffering from COVID-19. Those affected. Those who are mourning. Those who are dying. We remember them today. In your name I pray. Amen. This morning I will call Gamu to come and read the word of God. And um, the readings are coming from um, the book of Job and also the book of 1 Peter 4 verse 1 to 11 in the book of John, chapter 19, verse 38 to 42. I think I, um, I've said the book of Job 14, verse 1 to 14. So I'll call upon Gamu to come and do the reading. Our reading today comes from the book of Job 14, verses 1 to 14. 1 Peter, verses 4, 1 to 8, and John 19, verses 38 to 42. Job 14, verses 1 to 14. Man born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. He springs up like a flower and withers away. Like a fleeting shadow, he does not endure. Do you fix your eye on such a one? Will you bring him before you for judgment? Who can bring what is pure from the impure? No one. Man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set limits he cannot exceed. 
So look away from him and let him alone, till he put in his time like a hired ram. At least there is hope for a tree. If it is cut down, it will sprout again. Its new roots will not fail. Its roots may grow old in the ground and its stump die in the soil. Yet as the scent of water, it will bud and put forth shoots like a plant. But man dies and is laid low. He breathes his last and is no more. As water disappears from the sea or a riverbed becomes parched and dry, so man lies down and does not rise. Till the heavens are no more, men will not awake or be roused from their sleep. If only you would hide me in the grave and conceal me till your anger has passed. If only you will set me a time and then remember me. If a man dies, we will he live again. If the days of my hard service, I will wait for my renewal to come. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 1 to 8. Living for God. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of the earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing and detestable idolatry. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to the men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Our last reading for today comes from the book of John 19, verses 38 to 42. The Burial of Jesus Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he was feared by the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus bought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with all the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with G Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish, of the Jewish tradition and day preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they lay Jesus there. This is the word of the Lord. Father, as we are gathered this morning, we want to hear you speaking to us. We want to hear you speaking to us. There is something that you want us to hear this morning. Open our hearts, Lord. Open our eyes. Open our ears so that we can hear you speaking to us. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, our theme for this morning is what are you doing with the rest of your life? What are you doing with the rest of your life? Words of preparation are saying from Psalms 90 verse 1 to 2, verse 10 and 12, it says, Lord have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth over, you had formed the earth and the world. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. The days of our life are 70 years, or perhaps 80, if we are strong. So teach us to count our days that we may gain a wise heart. What are you doing with the rest of your life? In the second reading, second verse of 1 Peter 4, this way sent out. Live for the rest of your life no longer by human desires, 
but by the will of God. Which means we need to live our life by the will of God, not by human desires. God's purpose for your life, which is this, you were shaped to serve God. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 verse 20, we are God's workmanship created in Jesus Christ to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now listen to that verse carefully. God created you to do good works. God made you to make a difference. He created you to be somebody and not a nobody. To make a difference, to bring a difference in this country. Do you know what this means? What matters is not how long you live, but how you live. What matters is not the duration of your life, but the, don the, the donation of your life. You were created to save. You are going to learn that God has given each one of us gifts and abilities that we are to use in his service. And that is what God wants us to do. These abilities are supposed to be used in his service. It is not the amount of time we are allocated, but the use we make of it that is significant. We need to consider the question, what are we doing with the rest of your life? Perhaps we ought to ask a few questions. How should I plan to use the rest of my life? Will I be able to deal with unexpected or any crisis? Are we able to deal with the unexpected or any crisis that arise among us? A good example is the coronavirus, which has just come. It's something we have never expected. Something that has stopped the whole world to a dysfunction. What do we think? How should you react to what I discover to be the inevitable? Let us pretend that it occurs to us that we do well to prepare a list of things we want to see accomplished in the remainder of our days. What would you put to the list of the remainder of your days? If you knew that you had only one week to live, what would you do with each of those seven days? How much time would you waste before attending to necessary matters? How much time would you spend in resting and sleeping? With whom would you most desire to spend those days and final hours? What would you want to make the first priority in your agenda? Life should not be wasted. We must continually have goals to be met. No matter what our circumstances may be, or how much time we think we might have, we need to know that time is so precious. So in our normal routine of life, we usually expect to utilize in the course of a day eight hours of vocation, eight hours of leisure, and special interest and in eight hours for rest and sleep. So the hours may vary from each of these, but a proportional division is needed for good feelings about ourselves and the state of our lives. Without some order and routine, we achieve less than we should, especially if we lack sufficient relaxation and sleep. Our text says it this way, each of us should use whatever gift he is received to save others. To make it more clear, my purpose in life is to save God by saving others. You were put here to save God, and the way you save God is by saving other people. Human beings are not an island. You are not created to become an island. You are created so that you live with other human beings, so that you can save others. And that is the core we are being reminded. We are all different. We have all different interests, different passions, different skills, different gifts, different abilities, and there's a reason for that. God made you the way you are, so you could do what he wants you to do. You are created for a reason. You are created for a purpose. So the first purpose today is ministry. When I use the word minister, don't think of a pastor or a staff member or someone who works full-time in a church. The Bible says that every believer is a minister. 
So anytime you serve God by serving others, you have become a minister. So that's why I believe in the priesthood of all believers. If you are a believer, you are a minister. So you should be ministering to others. You should be doing something. If you have become like Jesus, then you will fulfill your purpose. Because Jesus said, your attitude must be like my own. For I did not come to be saved, but to save. In Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus came so that he can save. If you are going to be like Jesus, then you are going to save like Jesus. And that is very important for us to know. If you are going to fulfill God's purpose for your which is ministry, then three things must be true about you. Three things must be true about you. What is it? You may have a nine to five job, but serving God is not a nine to five proposition. Serving God is 24 7. You must always be ready to serve God. Proverbs 3, verse 28 says, If you can help your neighbor now, don't say, Come back tomorrow and then I'll help you. You should help your neighbor then. If your neighbor comes, you don't say, I'm sleeping with my kids. I'll come and save you tomorrow. You have to wake up there and there. So that is what we need to know. People who have a servant spirit and a servant heart are ready to save at a moment's notice. John Wesley, John Wesley, the great Methodist preacher, lived by this motto all of his life. Do all the good you can. By all the means you can. By all the ways you can. In all the places you can. And all the times you can. To all the people you can. As long as ever you can. That is what it means to be ready to serve God. That is exactly what it means. I have said all of my life. And we always say it. The greatest ability is availability. And without availability, and ability is wasted ability. I know what some of you are listening who are listening right now, they are saying, I'm too busy with other things to serve God. I've got good news for you if you are too busy to serve God. Think about it. Everything is at hold at the present moment. All the airports, not functioning. All the big shops, not functioning. All our stadiums, they are not functioning. Today you are locked in your room, in your own house. Are you too busy? <laughs> are you too busy today? If you are too busy to serve God, you are not only too busy. You are far busier than God ever intended you to be. And you are too busy doing the wrong things. The Bible says, forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. In Philippians 2 verse 4. The number one enemy to ministry is businessness. Just being busy for nothing. Too busy. Another reason we don't serve God is related to the first one, and that is we serve the wrong master. Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve both God and man. In Luke 16 verse 18. Okay, maybe you may misunderstand me. Jesus didn't say you should not save both God and money. He said you cannot save both God and money. Everybody saves somebody or something. You save somebody or something. If you want to fulfill God's purpose for your life, you had better make sure you save the right God. The God of the Bible. You better make sure you save the right thing, and that is people. Otherwise, you are going to live a totally wasted life. You will live a totally wasted life. You must be responsive to God's service. Let me tell you exactly what I mean by this. Ministry is not what you have to do for God. It is what you get to do for God. Paul was talking about the ministry God had given him and he made this statement. How thankful I am to Jesus Christ our Lord for the power and the strength he had given me. He's thanking God for that. He trusted me and gave me his work to do. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12. Paul did not look at his ministry as a duty. 
But he looked at it as a delight. He didn't look at the, at, at the opportunity of service as a burden. But he looked at, at the opportunity as a blessing. And that is the way we need to look at it. Psalms 102. Serve the Lord with gladness. I want you to remember something about ministry. God does not expect you to minister for him. And rightly so. God expects you to have a place of service. You have a place of service in your life. God expects you to have a job in the church. God expects you to do something meaningful for others in the church. But he not only looks at what you do, but he looks at why you do it. If you don't have in your heart right now a burning desire to do something constructive and something meaningful in the church, for the church, for God and for others, then you really need to go back and review what God has done for you. Let me just tell you, if you are a believer, three ways that ought to motivate you to want to save God is that God saved you. God saved you. I am saved. I am a saved person. Saved by the grace of God. So for you also to save others, you need to remember that God saved you in the first place. If God never did anything else for you, that ought to be enough to motivate you just ought to, out of gratitude to save him with the rest of your life. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9 says, It is he who saved us and chose us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan. God has saved us. Just out of gratitude for that, we ought to serve God. And that is important for us to know. While I am in the neighborhood, may I tell you that I have learned in ministry there are only two kinds of believers. Only two kinds of church members. There are grateful believers and gripping believers. There is nothing wrong with constructive criticism either of God's pastor or of God's church. Let me be honest. 99.9% .9 of the time, criticism is never meant to be constructive. It is meant to be destructive. In most cases. I want you to think about something. Any time you spend in criticizing, it's time you could spend being grateful for what God has done for you. Any time you spend looking for the negative, it's time wasted you could have used for looking for the positive. There are a lot of good things that are happening. When you see an opportunity to save God, or when you see a job that needs to get done, that no one is doing, be responsive. Even if it is not in your area of giftedness necessarily. Be thankful that God has given you an opportunity to express your love to him by saving him. Be there to save. You must be a reliable person in God's service. We need reliable people. The Bible in Proverbs 10 verse 6 says, Many, many, many tell about their own loving and good ways. But who can find a faithful man? Who can find a faithful person? That is what God is looking for in his church. Faithful servants. Do you know what faithful means? It means you don't give up. It means you don't quit. It means you finish the job like Jesus Christ who ended up saying, it is finished. You have finished the job. Jesus would say to his heavenly father, I glorified you on earth by completing down to the last detail what he has assigned me to do. In John 17 verse 4. Jesus didn't give up. He didn't give in. He didn't give out. He finished the job. And that is what we are called to. That's our task. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he says the one thing required of servants is that they be faithful. Now think about that. That is the only thing God requires of you to be a servant. If you are faithful, you can serve God. If you are faithful, you can be a minister. If you are faithful, God can use you. And that is what we need. Special mention is made of the women who had been faithful minister to the Lord and who had followed him all the way from Galilee to Jerusalem. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and John, and Salome the wife of Zebedee. Were there. 
The fearless devotion of these women stands out with special lustre. They remained with Christ when the male disciples ran for their lives. These women were there. Joseph of Arimathea was a secret disciple who revealed his faithfulness at a crisis point in John 19, verse 38. Joseph's willingness to approach Pilate as well as his generous burial of Jesus indicates that he took an outward step towards a stronger faith and commitment. What kind of crisis will it take to inspire us to devote our lives wholeheartedly to God? What kind of crisis? John tells us that Nicodemus went with Joseph in preparing the body of Jesus for burial. And they came, they came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night and brought a mix of milk and alloys and about a hundred pound weight. Then took the board of Jesus and wounded it in a linen cloth with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bear in John 19 verse 39 to 40. We are seeing this happening. So the two men who apparently had been in the background now came out in the open as the disciples of Jesus. It is interesting to note that only loving hands touched the body of Jesus after his death. <laughs> only loving hands. And laid it in his own new tomb, which he had worn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the speculator and departed. I want you to think about this next statement. Most of what we do in life doesn't matter. It isn't going to matter tomorrow. It isn't going to matter next week. Even next year, even next decade, any ministry you do for Jesus will matter for all eternity. And that is what we need to know. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 says, Throw yourself into the work of the master, confident that nothing you do for him is a waste of time or effort. Nothing you do for God is not a waste of time. Do you see the word nothing there? That means nada, zero. You can't do anything for God whether it is greeting people at a door, putting up and taking down a booth, singing to a babe or changing a diaper that God doesn't see. And that God is not going to reward. In fact, it is the work that we think is insignificant that makes it possible the work we think is insignificant. If you take away the people who are teaching your children right now, if you take away the people who are looking after your children right now, if you take away the people who are looking after elder, elder right now, the people who just read the scriptures and prayers up here in the church, the people who send you emails and text messages for you to read the message, and the notices and the people who are producing this video image and the people who are running the sound, we don't have a service. I can't do any ministry without these people. The fact of the matter is some of God's most anonymous servants are some of God's most important servants. Behind the closed doors, they are doing great work. And we need to thank these people. Have you ever wondered why you are here listening to my message? Let me help you and tell you why. You are here listening because God has given you something to give back. He didn't bring you just to sit and listen. He brought you to serve. And that is what we are supposed to do. God has uniquely gifted you to be part of the family. The gifts and the talents you possess were given to you to share with others. So become a partner with the whole church and fill out the roster. For we have, when the COVID-19 is gone, Give the offering also, even online, even going to the bank and doing. God is asking you to do something to serve. You are needed. You can make a difference. If you would like to serve, contact me or others, stewards or elders who heads up our lay ministry involvement. And he will be glad to help you find your place in the ministry. Call me. Ask me what you can do and I will tell you. If you don't know what you can do. If you are not careful, you will think a lot of these jobs are important, significant, beneath your dignity. That the next time you are tempted to think that that way, listen to this verse. Hebrews 6 verse 10. 
God will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other Christians. That verse is very important in your life if you don't know who to serve. I know some of you are listening and thinking that you really can't serve God because you are not very talented or maybe you think you only have one talent and it is not much of a talent if you never use it. Nobody will ever miss it because it's not a talent. It has never been used. Jesus told a story in Matthew 25 about a man who had a talent and he buried it in the ground. The master who gave him that talent was furious because he didn't use his talent to produce anything. And that is what we need. All over the world, in church after church, there are millions of talents that are buried because so-called one talent. People will not put that talent to work. Put what you have to work. I want you to listen to this last statement. The most important thing you will ever do with your life is serve God in ministry. Answer this question. What on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Where is your ministry? Where is your ministry? Where is your service? Men of you today need to get your bed and your glove. Put on your uniform. Say to the Lord who created you, put me in Father. I am really to save. Help me, Father. I want to save. Guide me, Father. I want to save. Protect me, Father. I want to save. Help me, Father. I want to save. Because you are created for something else. And that's what I want you to know. Job 14, verse 14. Ask a most important question. If a man dies, shall he live again? Our Lord answered the question in John 11, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So we are not working for nothing. Yes, our Lord will resurrect. He has resurrected already. I know that. I know that. So, put your faith to something. What are you doing with the rest of your life? May the good Lord bless you. May he continue to help you and encourage you so that as we are moving forward, we are not worried. This, do something that is helpful even during this coronavirus. There are people who are doing a lot of work, who are doing great work. The nurses, the doctors, firefighters, a lot of people are doing great work, helping other people to go on. May the good Lord bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you. We thank you for the life you have given us. We thank you that among us the greatest thing is that you have given us the gift of life. So for us to know that we live, we need to save others. May you help us, Lord, that we should never forget to save others. It is our duty. It is our mandatory duty to do that. Father, we are here because of you. You have created this world so that we are in the world but not of the world, but so that we can show the difference within the world. We can bring a difference within the world by our work, by our duties. Let us not hesitate to show that God has created us for a purpose. For it is for this reason that we are here. Bless you. Bless us, Lord. Bless every one of us. Thank you, Father. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ continue to bless you. Amen.